Hi, everyone. My name is Rabindra Hayashi, and I'm the Events Production Coordinator here at CAM. I'm so happy to be here with you today. You just watched Delicado, a riveting, inspiring, and deeply troubling documentary about Palawan, a tropical island in the Philippines. While in many ways a tourist's dream with white sandy beaches, clear blue waters, and lush, diverse forests, it is also one of the most dangerous places for an environmental crusader. Bobby, Nieves, and Tata face murder, betrayal, and politics in their race to save their beloved island, also known as the last ecological frontier. We are incredibly lucky today to have the filmmakers Caro Balucanas and Caro Magasnak Ali Kapala, excuse my pronunciation, here with us today. We're also so fortunate to have the activist, attorney, and subject of this film, Bobby Chan, as well. I'd like to um, invite everyone to join us in the studio now. Hi there. Hi. Hi, Rabindra. Um, first of all, thank you all so much for being here today. Um, this is a really powerful documentary about the dedication, danger, and devotion that goes into protecting environment, protecting land, and protecting nature. Um, and to that end, I wanted to extend a special thanks to Bobby for taking time out of uh, his really busy schedule to be here with us today. Um, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. Um, and just so everyone knows, we're recording this across quite a few different time zones. So we really appreciate everyone taking time at sort of odd hours to do this. Um, and so I'd like to start off with um, actually a question for Carl. And please, everyone chime in if you have else to uh, something else to add. But I want to start by asking um, a little bit about how this project got started um, and what your relationship with this story is. Uh, well, it started more than a decade ago. Uh, I was a journalist for Agence France Press, uh, AFP, based in Manila. And I was heading down to, uh, to Palawan to do an innocuous story on ecotourism. Uh, I was going to go and meet an environmental campaigner who was going to show me his, uh, his, his little uh, tourist um, projects. Um, but a few days before I was about to go down, he was shot in the head and, and killed. Uh, so I decided to go down and, and investigate his murder. Uh, and while I was there, um, I un sort of discovered this incredibly brave group of land defenders who were putting everything on the line to try and protect this island paradise. And one of the first people I met when I was down there was was Bobby. And, uh, and, and Bobby uh, had this uh, uh, tree made of chainsaws out the front of his office. And uh, on it was a little banner that said, stop illegal logging. And I asked him what that was about. And he started to tell me about uh, the, his uh, men who were going into the forest you know, barefoot, you know, um, without arms, and you know, using this little known citizen's arrest law to go and uh, confiscate chainsaws in the forest. And Bobby you know, was in, in this climate of fear and intimidation in Palawan, um, where people a bit were getting killed. Bobby was building this chainsaw tree um, out the front uh, on one of the main streets so everyone could see as a statement uh, to say, uh, don't be afraid. Uh, don't be scared. Um, you know, uh, it was a call to action. And I knew right then it was, there was something pretty special. And that's how it began. Yeah, thank you so much for um, sharing. And then like on that, like that chainsaw tree is so such a powerful image. Um, and so, Bobby, do you mind telling us a little bit about where the idea for the chainsaw tree came from initially? Uh, I'd like to think that it was because of my Catholic faith that we erected a Christmas tree. We believe in Santa Claus. And so we, we decided to have a Christmas tree made out of chain. So it was a little bit of art, a little bit of Christianity and our f strong faith in our religion. But uh, uh, half of it, though, is, is because we were running out of space. Uh, where we could put confiscated items. It, it's, a, it's a misnomer to think that we were just confiscating chainsaws. I mean, if you ask Carl, we had big boats, dynamite fishing uh, vessels, uh, mining equipment, trucks from logging, uh, jeeps and vans from wildlife smuggling. So we were just running out of space. And I said, maybe if we just put the chainsaws like a on like a toe temple and then and then they decided well, let's make it into a tree so and then when christmas came we hanged uh fire lanterns all uh, 
all, all around it to recognize our de our, our dead uh, para enforcers and then it, it became a, a christmas tree so a little bit of both that's really that's really lovely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and really intense. And then I also wanted to ask. Then um, you know you mentioned about the unfortunate um, the what do you call it? the people who worked with the organization who uh, passed away or were killed. Um, and so I know that this film makes very clear that um, Bobby, you and all of your fellow activists are taking a really huge amount of personal risk in doing the work that you do. Um, and so I want to know a little bit more about what you thought the risk was in taking part in a, a documentary like this might be, um, and then what you hoped to get out of the documentary when you went into the project. From when, when we uh, started out on this project, we didn't really look at the risk of that there would be uh, death deaths in our family and in in our staff and. We did not even think that there would be physical injuries. We just knew that something different had to be done. Uh, when when I started out as in, in environmental law, the main remedy was to teach people about the value of the environment and to teach them not not to do uh, violative uh, uh, or destructive activities. But we did that for a couple of years, and I found out that it really wasn't working. I said we need something stronger, and we need something. We need to address something that was basic. So I said instead of teaching or studying species or doing research work, I think the important remedy was to stop the violation first. So we were really weren't concerned about what we we didn't have that foresight that things would get more hostile. But we started doing it, and then we lost men along the way. And then the, after the first decade, we decided to uh, refine our program so that we can avoid uh, people dying and people being hurt. Uh, and, and yeah. So it was a painful journey to learn from. So, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm just glad that uh, uh, while the film was being made, uh, Carl and the team were safe, although while they were making it, w one of our para enforcers died in the process. So that that was unfortunate. Yeah, and that's actually something that I wanted to ask um, both Kara and Carl about too. Um, is like when you were making this film, uh, you know, death was a. It seems like it may not. You may not have realized that, or it may not have been totally clear that like death was going was a real possibility in making the film. Um, but how did you manage risk for the production team as you were making this? So I take that one. <laughs> uh, well, um, one one of the main things was just keeping a very um, uh, small team and a and a very low profile. Uh, so uh, for most of the time, essentially, there was uh, Tom Bannigan, uh, the cinematographer, and and myself. Um, you know who were who were doing on in in the field most of the time. Um, that was very much for 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 security reasons. Um, going into the into the um, the forest with, with, with the guys, um, we we try to keep it absolutely as small as possible. Uh, Tom is uh, a very experienced uh, war correspondent. Um, and he's done a lot of conflict reporting um, uh, th throughout his career. Uh, myself, I've also done a lot of con conflict reporting. Uh, so, you know, we took our, our I guess, our journalistic um, skills and, and background and experience uh, in, in, into covering this. Um, so, uh, but having said that, you know, going into the forest immediately, the very first time, you know, we went in and we were with Tata and and the guys and you got a sense of of, of I wouldn't say calm but a sense of confidence um that we were in good hands um you can see tata in the in the forest doing his hand signals and and okay. and the way they operate in their forest they you know they, they may be in bare feet and they may not you know have weapons but that doesn't mean they're not professional um so we we, we felt no 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 confident going in with them yeah, and I think that confidence really does um, show in the film um, because you know in the in the opening parts of the film, um, I know myself, I, it was almost like, oh wow, they're taking the chainsaws and they're making it look like it's no big deal, like they're so good at it, um, <laughs> and that was you know it was really quite amazing to see. Um, but then I do want to also ask, uh, 
you know, when you're, you mentioned that you have experience as like a war correspondent um, and like what he called the cinematographer also had uh, experience with um, conflict zones. So um, how do you manage the ethics of that when um, something uh, unfortunate starts to happen do you, in your role as a filmmaker? Well, we, we, we see it as, as documenting the reality. Uh, we, we, we tried, you know, you know the, the whole time to be that fly on, on, on the wall, to, to just, we weren't interfering in, in the process. We, uh, we continue just to, just to document. Um, you know, Bobby and his team have uh, had, um, you know, years and years of doing this, and we just captured a moment of their, uh, of, 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 the, of their journey. You seem to have lost Kara. I think Kara's coming right back in, um, and hopefully we can get Kara back on screen. Welcome back, Kara. Um, the timing is excellent because I actually had a question. For a while. It's all it's all right. Um, the timing is for it because I actually wanted to um, hear more about from you um, a little bit more about like the timeline of like the making of this documentary in particular. Um, and like how it was transformed as you were make, as it was being made. Well, first of all, I wanted to add something to what Carl said earlier. Yep. Um, this is the first time we're actually seeing on film the inside of the forest of Palawan and what it looks like when you actually have all these trees cut and what the what all the parent forces go through. This is the first time. Um, we all know the concept of illegal logging. We know that Palawan is endangered, but we never really knew what that was like so the film is putting a face and a feeling to all these concepts so embodied by people like bobby tata and yevis the timeline well like any other production it took forever but the bigger challenge was the pandemic um, it's a good thing we did most of the principal photography before the pandemic hit i think our last shoot was the end of 2019 um, i was in palawan i think around november december october but shortly after that the post-production was a challenge because we were all in different countries as we were finishing the film. So I think it took us more than a year longer than planned. Um, but then I think it also was useful because we were in close, closer contact. And I think the time difference was the only challenge. And Carl was a very um, a good leader because he would really accommodate everybody's views. It's not usual for every director. I've worked with so many directors. So that also took a lot of time. He was very open as a first time director to many comments, many suggestions. So we can really say that this film is very collaborative. Other than that, there was really nothing unusual about the timeline, but really the pandemic was a big challenge. And of course, getting in and out of Palawan was also a challenge. I mean, just getting to the forest, sometimes they would, they would really, happen i mean that doesn't sound good right but nothing in terms of anything telegenic would really happen so yeah yeah thank you so much for sharing that um because that because that the crisis of like coronavirus is also happening simultaneously like or starting to happen simultaneously alongside this film um, and you know it's that challenge really manifests uh later on but it's interesting to um hear that and how that affected um i also wanted to ask um this is a question i'm going to throw at um all of you uh but you know, one of the things that I really appreciate about this film is the way that it tries to think about um, land sovereignty and trying to get people to understand a relationship with nature where nature is not just exploitative. Um, that is to say, like, it's not a question where nature is just resources waiting to be taken. Um, it's a deeper relationship with land, with um, nature, with ecology. And so I wanted to ask um, for all three of you, but especially for Bobby, how would you hope viewers change their uh, understandings of land, of nature, or ecology after watching this film? Wow, that's even harder than my bar exam. Uh, <laughs> all right, there were, when, when, when we start, with, uh, when the film was finished, and uh, I believe me, I had an altercation with Carl about this. I said, there's an important thing that you did not include in the film. I think you know what it is. Let me just ask uh, Carl, what is it, Carl? May it have something to do with pride, Bobby? Pride, pride. And I said, uh, to Carl, we want to change mindsets and, and we want to change how people think they can provide a remedy on saving our planet. Uh, and, then, and, and I said, 
for my from my years of experience in trying to stop environmental destructions, I always come upon the same concept of this thing called pride. Our problem is not an external one. It's actually an internal one. When people who are in a position to lead have so much pride, they cannot lead. They should not lead. They dismiss beautiful programs like this that actually work. And then they put resources on programs that are eloquently beautiful on a narrative report, but don't really make sense or and don't have results in the field, in the forest, in the, in the coral areas. They don't. So if we can just uh, put that section and, or, or speak about being a less, less bit proud, taking that, uh, that pride away from our leaders, being open-minded to solutions that actually work, then we're in good shape. And the second one is also to bring back God into running our affairs, especially in the environment. We've tried remedies by arrogantly looking at ourselves for the solution. But we're not including something, a higher power, that will give us or sustain us and guide us into the right remedy. And this is what we've done. You know? We tried this in the first decade. We tried to do it by ourselves. But, you know, we failed drastically. But when we included Jesus and God in the equation, we find out that there is this thing about providence and deliverance that gives us guidance, gives us small miracles. And then now you have a, a an enforcement program run by civil society, not government, mind you, run by ordinary fisher folk, farmers, and tribal people that actually works. Thank you. Thank you. No, I really appreciate that. And I think that... Um what you're what you're really advocating there and like having that greater sense of um something more than just us is really some a, a really interesting way to examine um and rethink of the way that we're thinking about the world around us um uh carl or kari did you have something that you wanted to add to that in terms of how you would hope viewers might change their thinking about nature um uh, i know that's a tough tough statement to follow carl go ahead I'm sorry about changing the way I think about nature, but just for me, I'll share very quickly um, sort of one of my most sort of powerful experiences. Uh, and that was when I was with the, with the guys in the forest. And uh, when they're trying to track down the illegal loggers, they often try and get to their sites before dawn um, in the middle of the night. And then they sleep and they sit on the outside of the forest uh, waiting for them to wake up. And um, so they don't, they can't get too close um, uh, when it's uh, when it's night time because it's quiet. So they wait. Then they wait for the chainsaws to start, and they and then and they move in. So you have these hours where you're sitting there in the darkness, and then you wait for uh, the dawn uh, to come. And as you sit there, you uh, you just hear the crickets and the wind, um, and and the frogs and and nature just in this this symphony, um, this orchestra. And you're sitting there amongst the guys, and it's you know I'm not I'm not spiritual in the way Bobby is or would like me to be, but I think we have that same we have that same feeling, that same emotion. And um, and Bobby always talks about stopping that one chainsaw. You know, you know, people say, oh, you know, it's only one chainsaw. Um, you know, what 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 are you really doing in the, in the whole big scheme of things? And for me, sitting there, I really understand what Bobby was 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 is getting at. Um, sitting there listening to that we're going to stop they're going to stop that one tree from being cut down today and that one chainsaw is going to come out and it's not going to cut down 600 trees and what we're listening to and experiencing in that moment um it just felt extremely yeah uh powerful so something spiritual i'm just going to build on what they said and they've said it so beautifully um i think in any for anyone you must define in your life what is enough um and I think everyone in the film has defined what is enough for them. And this also includes defining your and clarifying your priorities, your values, um, including how you take care of your home, which is the environment. And after the pandemic, I think we all realize we don't really need that much. I mean, even if you have billions of dollars, 
even before the vaccine. You couldn't even buy a cure to, you know, to COVID before the vaccine. And you couldn't have space in the hospital either. So it should have re-clarified a lot of people's values and priorities. And I think whatever is enough is different for all of us. And it shouldn't be something that will deprive someone else of their home, their resources, and especially their lives. That's too selfish. That's too greedy. The characters in our film have defined what is enough for them. And they chose a life with purpose that leads them, leads them to a path that very few choose. It's a very noble path. Um, it has really um, shown and elevated their spiritual connection to nature, their love for their home, and for other people and ecosystems that thrive on this forest. So that's one of my biggest takes, uh, watching these three people um, really advocate for something they believe in. Yeah, I think that I think what you're saying is totally true. That's such a good way to encapsulate it because um, that passion, but also that that belief, really spurs people into this action. Um, and I love that idea of people understanding what they need um, and what they need to do in terms of purpose, both in terms of their relationship to other people and their relationship to their work and their relationship to um, the land around them. Um, what I wanted to ask too for all three of you um, is. Have you been able to talk to any audiences after showing this film? Um, and what have, audi what have been audience reactions in your conversations with them? We, we haven't been l l lucky enough yet. We, we've just, we've just uh, premiered at, at, uh, at Hot Docs in, in Toronto. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, the three of us are, uh, are still in Asia. We weren't unfortunately able to get over for that. Um, uh, we've had um, a, some of our team members over and and they said that it was uh it was a wonderful reaction there was a, a lot of um, emotion coming out of the uh, uh, out of the film and one of the uh the first questions that people had was how can they how can they help what can they do and that's what we're hoping to do we're, we're trying to to build sort of an impact campaign that will you know that will uh, seek to protect land defenders um, and the forests um, in palawan the philippines and beyond um, and so we're, we're getting a feeling that people are emerging out of the film, uh, feeling angry, feeling emotional, feeling, you know, they're wanting to do something. And that's what we're, that's what we're striving for. Yeah. And I think that Bobby, you really, Bobby in particular really inspires those feelings of, of wanting to do something, of really wanting to, um, help. And so I, this is to be, to, as we move into that question of, of how people can help, just like Bobby, what's the status of your work right now? Well, we uh, we used to have four projects uh, with four big funders. Now we're down to one, you know, because uh, as you can see, our work is not palatable to the big funding agencies because it's a one, it's a hostile endeavor. I mean, people die, people get hurt, and second, it's 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 an argument for something that the government should be doing and not civil society or NGOs. So. It's tough to get uh, funding, uh, especially to, for work like this. So when we, so you could you, you could imagine when we received our first one hundred dollar donation from the Toronto uh, film, and everybody was excited. They said, "Oh, God, now we can get get our guys back into the world." Because at the start of the pandem pandemic, until now, we have rarely gone back to the forest because we. We don't have gas money and we don't have money for meals of the community, which we include every time we do confiscation uh, operations. So now we can get back and I, our, our problems are really basic uh, um, money for gas, money for food so that we can get our team into it. And, and because people report to us eh? and uh, uncannily, I don't know why they don't report to the government agencies. They report to us because I think when they report to us, they know that when we confiscate the chainsaw, it will not go back. When we confiscate the conveyance, the trucks, the jeeps, it will not be returned to the violator. So they have that trust in us. And uh, sometimes we just have to ferret out which reports we can respond to with this meager resources that we have. So it'd be nice to respond to all. That, thanks for uh, sharing that with us. Um, and, you know, it's interesting you're talking about like the funding and like, so, you know, kind of at the root of a lot of this, um, a lot of the environmental issues is this sort of this really huge disparity in income um, in Palawan. 
and I think that that comes out very strongly as well. Um, and so, sorry, if you sorry, want can, to... can I, sorry, can I just cut something yes, I forgot? And this is really important. You know? It's not that there's a dearth of money in the environment. I'm just appalled why some funding agencies can hire consultants who will do policy making and studies at really exorbitant rates and not give meager subsidy to para enforcers who per, per patrol our forest. For example, the, a consultant, uh, the, the smallest consultant in Palawan would probably be earning 50,000 a month. I pay my para enforcers 8,000 a month. So you can see how many para enforcers can be patrolling the area at 50,000 divided by eight, uh, uh, by 8,000 instead of one consultant who will tell us something we already know intellectually and eloquently <laughs> into a policy paper that nobody will use. I'd rather have my para enforcers in the forest or in the high seas coming back with a chainsaw or a dynamite fishing boat. So mm -hmm. I, I, it's frustrating that we don't know where to put our funding resources. And I hope people will, enough of the consultants, please. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, I, I thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, I think that have that, that really, that anger about um, that sort of like abstracted approach to doing anything. I mean, it's almost like an intentional waste of money to be like, oh, we're doing something mm -hmm. like, oh, um, but I wanted to ask, so then for viewers who watch this and who want to help, um, unfortunately, this is airing right after the election. And so that's done already. But how can viewers help? Bobby? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I thought I, I, I think, well, you can donate to uh, pnni.org. I think I got that right. Uh, mm -hmm. So that we can have funds to bring our men to respond to reports and communities also teach communities to respond and to do self-help methods like this that we'd appreciate that uh, hopefully the the our leaders in these elections would be more uh, open and less le less less proud of themselves yeah thank you yeah, thank you so much for um, sharing that. Uh, and then I also wanted to check in too for uh, aspiring documentary filmmakers or people who are fans of documentaries um, and want to know more about the film too. How can people learn more about the film? Well, wonderful. They can um, reach out to us, yeah, on our social media pages. Go ahead, Carl. Oh. Okay, Carl. So you got yeah, go. we have yeah we have several social media pages and you've flashed some of the handles on screen. That's how they can reach us, and they'll actually be uh, in direct you know in direct connection to me and Carl and other producers of the film. We would love to hear from everyone. We 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 also have on on uh, delicado uh, film dot com. Uh, there's a sign up. Um, we, we we are building this uh, th this campaign. We we've, we've got partners uh, around the world uh, who are going to be helping us to to raise awareness and 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 empower uh, land defenders, uh, not only in the Philippines uh, but further afield. So they can just sign up to uh, and they put their email address in, and we'll keep them updated. Um, and 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 also just want to an, another shout out for Bobby and and P and I. Um, on the pni.org, you can they can donate directly. Uh, also on their Facebook page, um, they can also follow uh, their actions. And you know, if, you, if Bobby said they haven't been able to do much over the past couple of years, but you actually see their posts where they've taken photos um, of the rare confiscations that they have done. And to me, they are just so inspiring. You know, throughout the past couple of years, against all the odds, through the pandemic, with virtually no money, they're still going out. Uh, and doing confiscations, and they're posting those photos. So check them out on, on, on their Facebook page. Thank you so much for sharing those. Um, I, I will, I personally am definitely going to check them out, and I hope that our viewers check them out. Uh, we're getting really close to time over here, unfortunately, but I wanted to, before we go, just is there anything else you would like viewers to know about your film, um, about the film? Bobby? Oh, about... No, I think I, I think the everything else is in the film. 
I'm just uh, I'm thankful to Carl and Kara for the opportunity to, to document our work. We, we we you know when Carl came came along, it, nobody was uh, no one was taking stock of what we did. We did we uh, when we did our work, it, nobody it wasn't it was dismissed and disregarded. But you know along comes somebody with a different eye and tries to make a film. You're the only one who asked us. To, hey, can we put you on film? Uh, we you rem remember we have a lot of local media, and they went. I don't know what they what they uh, what stories they made, but they they did not want to make a, a story about us. So I'm I'm thankful that Carl came along. I I was going to say no prophet is welcome in his uh, hometown, and it takes a foreigner to find find out we're doing something good. But I'm really glad that. There's a Filipino side to it, and then thank you, Kara, also for uh, taking time to, uh, to say yes to produce this film. Thank you both. I, uh, I'm very grateful uh, in, on behalf of my men and uh, and our staff and our communities from Palawan. Thank you both. Thanks, Bobby. Ravindra, yeah. I just wanted to add. You know, Carl and I were talking to Tata and his daughter last night. Tata, the forest mm -hmm. ranger, Farah and Forester, and um, it's the first time his family saw the film and see what he actually does inside the forest. And every time he leaves, they're very nervous, they're very anxious. And you can imagine there were many probably arguments in the family about what are you doing? It's so not worth it. We don't have enough to send the kids to school. The wife had to, you know, do other things to make ends meet. So I'm sure it was a struggle the way any other ordinary job that's resource challenged. But when they saw the what the father does in the forest or Tata, they were in awe, they were shocked. And then such great admiration. It's like, oh my goodness, our father, our husband is, is a superhero for the environment. And they were saying, it, we were beaming with pride. Um, now all our neighbors will see us very proud and we know it's very worth it. And Tata even said, wow, I never knew that I could, that my work is important. It's worth it, the big screen. And that um, now there's more appreciation for what I do, and people will hopefully also love what I love, which is Palawan, my home. That's such a that's such a lovely um, what do you call it? Such a lovely sentiment. Um, and I'm really glad that people are able to that it's able to like help with the families too, and for the people in it that it's something for them as well. Um, and so, Carl, I'm gonna say, did you have any last words that you wanted to say about the film? before we close for today? Uh, look, just a, one other little thing that people can take away from the film is when they do go to wonderful tourist paradises, whether it's in Palawan, you know, Philippines or elsewhere around the world, take a moment to think about uh, what what's happening in those places um, it is, and, and whether your uh, actions and, and your travels there can be a positive uh, uh, thing for the community or a negative and try and act consciously on that. Thank you so much for that sentiment. Um, I want to once again express my gratitude from myself and all of the staff here at CAM for to all of you for taking the time to come speak with us today. Uh, the 40th anniversary um, CAM Fest runs from May 12th to May 22nd, 2022. Um, so if you're watching, please be sure to check out our other programming as well. Once again, thank you to Carl, Kara, and Bobby for your time today. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Ravindra. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.